Hello, I'm Desiree DuVernay, and you might want to form some judgments about things, but um, that's what this is kind of about. We want to talk about judgments, and what we're going to be talking about today is homeopathy, natural medicine versus traditional medicine. Now, let's look at a cut just recently from the BBC that took place in Parliament. It was years and years ago, back in 19, geez, 1991, they asked me to come to Parliament and to talk. It was very interesting. One of the little side rooms, you know. Very much what we're going to see now here today. This is a committee's review on homeopathy. Jamie, the MHRA has a number of yellow cards. The FDA has reports of adverse effects, generally mild and transient, but there are the do, the do appear to be some. And I think what um, Peter just referred to, or at least partly referred to, is, is called homeopathic aggravation. Homeopaths believe that if they find the ideal optimal remedy, then uh, there, there, there will be an aggravation, or can be an aggravation in about 20% of, of patients that is expected. Um, Peter also knows because he has in his journal published our systematic review of, of uh, testing whether these aggravations are, are real. Um, and, and we looked at all, all the clinical trials and counted the, the, uh, such events, and we've, we found no statistical, statistically significant difference between the aggravations reported in the placebo arms as compared to the uh, homeopathic uh, treated arms. So um, the, the story of homeopathic aggravations may well be a myth. Thank you. D Dr. Thurman, is it ethical for the NHS to prescribe uh, placebos? Should the NHS uh, can prescribe placebos? I struggle with the notion that it's ethical to prescribe placebos. I think that, um, um, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, I think that a number of, of the ways in which people behave or prescribe could be described as prescribing placebos, but in principle, if you prescribe a drug which you know to have no clinical efficacy on a basis which is essentially dishonest with a patient, I personally feel that that is unethical behaviour. And is the natural conclusion from that that the NHS shouldn't spend money on placebos? I, I would very much think that's a logical conclusion, and to me, this is all about following the evidence to its logical conclusion. Somebody else wants to? Can I clarify, I think, a key point that has not yet been raised this morning, and that is that there are a significant number of homeopathic medicines that are not diluted to the point where the molecular content is uncertain. Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't know. There are a substantial number of homeopathic medicines <coughs> where there is molecular content. There seems right. to be an assumption that they are, to quote from an earlier commentator, they are just sugar pills. In fact, many are not just sugar pills. And many of those have been investigated in randomized controlled trials. And some of those have shown clinical effectiveness beyond placebo. And some of those, in turn, have shown clinically relevant and, and meaningful e effects of homeopathic medicines compared with placebo. So there are trials out there which are of good, good quality and of good design with good sample sizes where positive evidence is available. And it's not cherry picking. Could you give us one example and, and get uh, Dr. Thalon to say whether in fact NHS prescribed? Vert Vertigo. There's a product, it's made in Germany. Regrettably, it's not available for use in the UK. It's called Vertigo Heal. And there is systematic review of the original randomized controlled trials showing that that product is efficacious beyond the placebo effect. Thank you, I hand up to, to answer the, 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 your question whether the NHS should prescribe placebo or allow placebos. But first about Vertigo Heal, this is not even a homeopathic product. This is a homotoxicological product, which strictly speaking is not homeopathic. But this may be too technical. I would argue it's very, that it's very interesting, that actually. <laughs> We're OK with that. Yeah, if, we'll call the Science if, Committee. If, <laughs> if, <laughs> if, <laughs> if one defines homeopathy as curing like with like, uh, the homeotoxicological treatments are, are not homeopathic. That is the, the point I was trying to make. But back to the placebo question. I would argue it is unnecessary, unreliable, and unethical 
to uh, prescribe this placebo through the NHS unnecessary because if you do it well, then um, an active treatment will also generate uh, a placebo effect. If I give my patient an aspirin for his or her headache and I do it with empathy, time and understanding, this patient will benefit from the pharmacological effect of the aspirin. It will also, she will also benefit from the placebo effect through the, through the encounter with, with her clinician. It is unreliable. There is lots of data to, to show that uh, placebo effects are notoriously unreliable. Who, somebody who responds today may not respond tomorrow. Uh, responses are not, not uh, large in effect size, and they are not um, by, uh, usually long-lasting. Foremost, it is unethical. That's my, my, my third you, point. Because you come to the same conclusion as Dr. Fallon, that the, therefore the NHS shouldn't spend money. Correct. Yeah. If I could just cover firstly on, on Vertigo Heal, it is actually registered as a homeopathic product in Germany and prepared according to the HAB, it's the Homeopathic Arzneibuch, which is the uh, German uh, homeopathic pharmacopoeia. Uh, but to come back to the other problem, the other question of, of placebo effects, I believe I'm the only person called today who actually practices homeopathy. I'm a rather atypical homeopath in the sense that I'm a doctor. I'm also an accredited rheumatologist. Uh, I could you know, prescribe all those nasty, toxic drugs that my friends and colleagues uh, prescribe and, and freely acknowledge you know, are, are less safe than they might wish. Uh, but I practice homeopathy because I think it works. I would not practice it, and I believe the, the evidence supports me in that. I would not practice it for two minutes if I thought I was conning the patients. And we just need to be clear about placebo effect because sometimes a lot of concepts get muddled up. Placebo effects, well, there are non-specific effects, sometimes also called context effects, um, and that means that every good doctor should talk to their patient, explain to their patient, give their patient good advice on diet and lifestyle, and do all of that before even thinking of reaching for the prescription pad. Um, but having done that, you know, and, and I have absolutely no shame about maximizing my non-specific effects, I think every good doctor should do it. But having done that, I would not uh, prescribe, use homeopathy for two minutes if I thought it was only a placebo. And I think the strongest evidence that it's not a placebo comes from an area that hasn't even been mentioned this morning, which is basic science. There is now a burgeoning area of basic science. There are, there are models which you can do in a test tube uh, which show effects with high dilutions and which have been now been replicated by multiple laboratories, multi-centre groups. There's, I believe, seven such models now by the last count. Uh, the most best-known one is inhibition of basophil degranulation by high dilutions of histamine. Uh, basophil is a model of the, of the immune response. There's another one concerning aspirin and blood clotting. There's another one concerning metamorphosis of tadpoles to frogs. A, and these have been replicated by independent groups or multicenter groups. Uh, the, the frog one was done originally in Austria, recently repeated in Brazil. But, right. Sorry. Just final question yeah. to, to the whole panel, if you could just answer quickly. Should uh, money that's spent on uh, homeopathic consultations be, to be redirected to elsewhere in the NHS. So with you, Dr. Fallon. Well, we very much take that view. Um, we, we, we wouldn't uh, swap it from one treatment directly to another, but clearly if the pr NHS, if, if the business of PCT is about prioritisation, then clearly a treatment which the balance of scientific opinion says is of, is of either virtually no efficacy or, or effectiveness or none, then we would prioritise that at a far lower level than other treatments we wish to commission. Thank you, Dr. Martin. To me, the question, it begs the question that uh, there is a need for cost-effectiveness evaluation of homeopathy. There is almost none to this at this stage. And the whole question about the, the cost and the, and the impact of the homeopathic consultation um, could be tested in, in appropriate studies. But the other problem is, I think, is that where does a patient go if he or she doesn't go to the homeopathic practitioner? And I'm talking about in typically a medical practitioner of homeopathy. They'll go elsewhere in the NHS and they may not get the rounded approach to treatment of the person, which is what homeopathy characteri is characterised by. Um, so there is a, there is, this is not a straightforward point, this. Thank you. Dr. Fisher? Um, it's a qu I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> the question was should uh, the, the money that's spent on uh, homeopathic consultations be redirected within the NHS? Well, I think the evidence, such as it is, for instance, there's, there's good evidence from France and Germany 
that you get more bang for your bucks with homeopathy. If you integrate homeopathy, you get better outcomes and it doesn't cost any more. So I don't think it should be redirected. You get more bang for your bucks. Professor Ernst? If the NHS's uh, commitment to evidence-based medicine is more than a lip service, then surely um, um, money has to be spent for treatments that are evidence-based and homeopathy isn't. Thank you. Dr. Fisher, minutes, you mentioned, Dr. Fisher, you mentioned that um, there were some adverse effects found yes. in homeopathic <coughs> treatments. How many homeopathic treatments over the 200 years that it's been in existence have been withdrawn from the market due to safety fears because of these adverse effects as one sees in conventional medicine? Uh, not many, but some have been. The uh, most recent one was something called Malaria officinalis, which was most regrettably, and, and I've opposed it, used by some non-medical homeopaths allegedly to, to prevent malaria. To it malaria had prevent. side effects, did it? No, that was, it was withdrawn because of safety concerns. Right, so on the basis of adverse effects, no, nothing has none been has been withdrawn. No. It's interesting. Uh, when Graham Stringer was asking the questions, he started with you, Professor Ernst, so you can get a chance to respond to the assertion made uh, to the, by the witnesses on your, on your left that systematic reviews showed effect, overwhelmingly showed effectiveness of homeopathy. Five out of six, I think, was the expression four used. Four out of five. Four out of five. It didn't use the word overwhelming. Four, four out of five uh, seems to be a majority. Would you comment on, on that? Is that were, are, have there only been five systematic reviews, and do they show that positive result, in your opinion? I have... Uh, S supplied you with, with a list of systematic reviews uh, as, as published as, uh, a few years ago and, and in, in, in that list there are already uh, I think almost two dozen. Uh, two dozen? Right. And, and, and uh, none in, in that list which was the list after a very prominent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis by Klaus Linde uh, was published in The Lancet. Um, none of, of of the systematic reviews, in, including the ones re-analyzing the Lancet data, including Linde re-analyzing his own data, none of these systematic reviews were positive. Why do you think that homeopaths say that systematic reviews are positive if it seems to you that they're not positive? Both sides I, I can't don't be know. right. I, I, I know of some reviews which are N not systematic. I know of a, of a Swiss health technology assessment, which, which is not what I understand by a systematic review, because it includes everything such as case series, observational studies, uh, non-controlled studies, non-randomized studies, and, and, and so forth. And, and when you do that, um, indeed, th the, the majority of publications is, is positive, but um, in a systematic review, typically you define your entry criteria, and we usually define them as randomized clinical trials, if possible, randomized placebo controlled clinical trials, and in, in, in homeopathy that is possible. And, and the, the vast majority of these systematic reviews um, do not um, confirm that homeopathy is, <coughs> homeopathic remedies are more than placebo. Dr. Matthew, do you accept that the overwhelming view of independent researchers who don't make money from conventional medicines competing with you or make money from practice or selling or manufacture of homeopathic medicines, do you accept, even though you may disagree with them, that the overwhelming majority of people who've looked at this from an independent perspective say that the evidence base is poor for efficacy, efficacy of of homeopathy when looking at good quality systematic reviews? Given that most people in that category probably haven't investigated the research literature in, in sufficient depth to really form a well-judged opinion, my answer would be yes. Right. But so there because are those they're ignorant, essentially. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. They just haven't done the job good enough, all these people what, like Professor what, Ernst, what? who's a professor of in this field, they're just they're just inadequate in their research. Not, not at all. What I what I would say is that there are those who, with whom I have endeavoured to collaborate and do have collaborations with, who are mainstream academic researchers. For example, in atopic eczema at the University of Nottingham, 
who are seriously engaged by the idea of conducting randomised controlled trials in homeopathy because atopic eczema is not well treated conventionally and they see effectiveness gap there and it's worth trying, it's worth testing in an objective, open-minded fashion. There are many people in the country who are prepared to engage in homeopathic research and it's those type of people that I'm very eager to collaborate with. Yeah, but systematic reviews take a lot of time. You have they to look through thousands of papers. Of and course they do. Check them whether they went the criteria. So they're, they're, you have to be quite dedicated yes. to do these systematic reviews and to review systematic reviews. And reviews, and of course. And the majority are, I mean, of those people, <coughs> without an axe to grind, yes. say that they don't show an effect. And of course does that worry you? It does. Um, however, reviews are designed to distill the literature out into us in a single paper or two compared with maybe a, a dozen randomised controlled trials. Can I just address the question about the discrepancy of opinion regarding the results of systematic reviews? And I just quote a recent paper by Dr Klaus Lindt himself in a paper published just a few months ago. And he says, with small and heterogeneous, heterogeneous data sets, the most likely situation in complementary and alternative medicine. Decisions can made, decisions about the validity of trials and, and which trials are contained within systematic reviews can lead to quite different findings. A powerful example of how different approaches summarizing the available evidence can lead to very different conclusions are the two large meta-analyses on homeopathy published in The Lancet in 1997 and in 2005, and we know which ones we're talking about there. Right. The data set themselves yielded similar findings. It's the interpretation that differs right. depending on one's perspective. Well, feel free to send that in to us. That's I probably can the easiest hand it thing. To you if you would um, like. I just want to deal with this ideal world, real world thing. I mean, if you can't find an effect, if you can't demonstrate efficacy in an ideal world where everything is set up to identify that mm -hmm. effect, it's hard to see that an effect you see in the real world, dirty clinical practice, if you like, is based on the on the cited efficacy. I understand. It might be due to confounding factors. It's I understand your question. It's not the other way around, is it? However, it's based on the false premise, if I may say so, okay. because in fact there is efficacy research there. There's published efficacy studies. There's something like 30 or 37 of them, if I remember offhand, where there is positive evidence. There's another 50 which are inconclusive or perhaps negative evidence. But what I would plea for is that. The efficacy studies that do exist, and I could name them all and I can send the details to you, they exist out there, they should transform gradually over time with active research into effectiveness research where those homeopathic medicines that are shown to be effective are used within the armamentarium of the homeopathic process because after all, what has not fully become clear this morning is homeopathy is a system of care. There are 3,000 homeopathic medicines in the pharmacopoeia. Yeah. We need to understand the efficacy on each, ideally, but let's gradually do it over those, with right. those uh, specific medicines where they are frequently used and have been researched in efficacy research and can become gradually evidence-based yeah. contributions to homeopathy as a right. system of care. Can, can I thought, like, ask, uh, got, I'd like to ask Dr. Thallon about, you've sent in evidence setting out how you did your review. And I don't think it's worth you repeating that because it's in the written evidence which will be published if we do a report on this, as I suspect we will. But I'd like to ask you, why do you think it's right that what you did should have to be replicated many times in every commissioning organisation? Or whether, uh, is, there, is there something in the water, or not in the water in West Kent, or not that makes your finding different from something that might be done in Manchester? Well, we were in a particular circumstance because there's a homeopathic hospital with our geographical locality, mm -hmm. and that's why we had to go to the links we did in order to prove the case, I think, because, you know, other commissioning organisations who spend a bit of money on homeopathy didn't have the facility within their borders that meant that yeah. the resistance to the commissioning decision was likely to be as intense as it was. Yeah. So I think that... Well, that I do think our process is a good... In terms of its quality and the way that it's with good scrutiny is a good roadmap for other organisations to adopt and we would be very happy to act as a guide to other commissioning organisations which wish to follow this path. But I, but I personally feel that if, if um, effectiveness in clinical treatment and evidence-based medicine is going to be an organising principle of the NHS, then to do this in every locality would be 
would be a, a diversion of other ways of scarce resources. And if it were possible to learn from our experience, then we'd be very happy to, to give that learning out. Have you considered either circulating it yourself? Would you have objections to other people circulating it? Or do you think it would actually save time and money if the Department of Health circulated your, your work? I, I certainly don't think the issue about um, of, of the decommissioning of non-evidence-based practice should be beneath the Department of Health to help commissioning organisations with. And yes, I would, I would have thought that there, sh there, there could well be a role for the Department of Health in helping other organisations get to the point we've got to, should they choose to do so. See, the Department of Health has not issued any guidance no. and has not asked NICE to look at this. Mm. And that may be a reluctance of the Department of Health to give any advice or instructions or guidelines or policies to commissioners. But my experience locally is that commissions are overwhelmed with guidance and advice they and, are. and executive <laughs> letters and circulars from Not the Not overwhelmed, but there's plenty of it. Why do you think, as an individual, I, in now, yeah. as an individual doctor who's got the views you have having looked at it, why do you think the, the Department of Health and the Ministers are not, are not dealing with this? I, I think I would, this would have to be a personal rather than yes, an organisational view. Yeah. Um, I think the politics of homeopathy and what homeopathy is are difficult because homeopathy, it, 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 to an extent, goes beyond, it appears to my mind, to go beyond the debate purely about the science because, because uh, I, I feel that, 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 that we have taken the view about where the balance of, of the scientific community's opinion is on homeopathy and to me and to my colleagues it's pretty clear. So clearly there's something that, that perpetuates the notion that homeopathy is important which goes beyond purely the scientific debate because to my mind that's gone, you know, insofar as it, it, it can never be settled because you, know, you never know what might happen but the balance of the current research at the moment suggests to us essentially scientifically trained but lay people that, that the issue of the effectiveness of homeopathy is not in question. My last question is to Dr Fisher. In your evidence, your written evidence, which I read uh, to us, your written submission, uh, and in your answer you talked about the basic science that, that shows a basis for the function of how homeopathy might work. I mean, some of it's radical stuff, I think it's fair to say. Why do you think that there has been no Nobel Prize given to the people who've made these <coughs> astonishing discoveries of, of the, the potential for the memory of water and and an impact, a physiological impact of some homeopathic remedies where the dilution is such that it's accepted that there's unlikely to be a single molecule left. It may yet happen. I think we're at a very early stage. I think the, the, the research has burgeoned in the last few years. Uh, it, needs, you know, it needs more work. But of course, you know, we're talking about a soci sociological th phenomenon within the, the scientific community. Of course, new ideas often encounter strong resistance. Uh, and I think that's what's going on. It does appear, and people loosely say, oh, it you know, challenges the basic laws of physics. It does not. It doesn't, okay. Well, but, on that but, basis, but, so though, it may why, yet happen. Why is it that when you've got a solution of water that used to have some homeopathic uh, substance in it, but it's been diluted, that the water is said to retain that memory, but doesn't remember all the, well, poo? You could call oh, it's been in it because all water has sure. has oh, it's, it's bits, quite of, simple. bits of yeah. I'm surprised you didn't mention Oliver Cromwell's bladder. In this context, it's a traditional to mention Oliver Cromwell's bladder because apparently somebody well, once calculated that in every glass of water you drink, it is statistically probable that one of those molecules once passed through Oliver Cromwell's and bladder. And that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but that's but that's even more. The point they're making is you've got a higher chance of having that molecule. But even if yes, you yes, don't believe course, the right. molecules necessary, mm. so why is it that the specific effects are from the homeopathic thing that's been in it and not someone's? Sure. Ammonia that's been yeah, in Yeah, it's quite, quite straightforward. The point is, you use highly purified water and highly purified ethanol. There is no such thing as absolutely pure water, but this is highly purified. It's double distilled, deionized. Uh, and then, so... The, the it's not even got sugar in it. No, sugar at that stage, no. Uh, and uh, so you're, the, the impurities are a concentration of parts per million or parts per billion. You then add something at a concentration of parts, one in ten or one in a hundred and shake it and so the, 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 the shaking is important the shaking is important See, I'd have thought it would have less memory if you shook it I well it's because it kind of left it alone 
it might kind of. Well, this has been looked at, and the answer is it doesn't induce the same structural effects. Uh, you are inducing structural effects which may involve silica, may involve uh, dilute, uh, dissolved oxygen molecules. It's not quite certain, but you can show how that this this water is different from water that is just just shaken. Right, and how much do you stopping. have to shake it? Uh, that has not been fully investigated. A, a random amount of shaking. Uh, well, you have to shake it vigorously, but exactly how much you have to shake it, if you just gently stir it, it doesn't work. Does but the MHRA check how much it's been shaken um, before it approves it? I, you would have to ask the MHRA, I don't know. Right. I don't know. I'm going to leave the shaking at, at that point. Uh, Professor Ernst, you just wanted to have a last yeah, just, word on Just that. a quick comment. Even if the water is different, uh, um, it, it totally leaves unanswered the question, how does it... Uh, exert any health effects in, in human bodies. The, the water in my kitchen sink is also different from distilled water, yet it's unhealthy, not healthy. Okay, we'll, we'll ponder on that. Dr. Eden. Thank you, Chairman. This year the uh, Department of Health announced that it was going to run some pilot studies on personal health budgets, allowing people to uh, spend public money on, to a degree, uh, whatever they desire to spend it on, including homeopathy. Uh, bearing in mind that the National Health Service is always short of money, this has already been referred to, is it right, do you think, gentlemen, that uh, people should be able to uh, take money away <coughs> from perhaps more deserving areas of the NHS and spend it on homeopathy if that's what the patient desires? Starting with Professor Ernst. This originates presumably from, from the ill-conceived notion that patient choice has to, do, has to dominate in healthcare. Um, I, I'm an ex-clinician and I, I know about the, the importance of patient choice, but patient choice that is not guided by evidence is, is not choice but arbitrariness and therefore uh, I'm not in favour of it. Dr. Fisher. Uh, I strongly support patient choice and clearly when patients do get the opportunity to choose, they, they very often do choose homeopathy and other forms of complementary medicine. And it's right that that should be with public money rather than their own money? Yes, yes, I think so. I mean, there needs to be a balance, but, but yes, I think patient choice, you know, successive governments have been committed to it, and rightly so, in my view. Thank you, Dr. The British Homeopathic Association strongly supports patient choice uh, and for treatments that are evidence-based and, and to propose the development of much greater research in order to secure that evidence base. Dr. Fowler. Um, I, I personally um, support the, 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 the issue of clinical effectiveness should be an organising principle of the NHS um, and it is conceivable that personal health budgets may cause some, um, some inefficient use of NHS resources. However, uh, there are limits to which uh, and NHS is not purely governed by clinical effectiveness. There are issues of, of patient um, consent and, and it's public money at the end of the day. Um, and it is conceivable that it may well be right for people to have an element of choice in what they spend their money upon. However, I think there are issues around, about, uh, around whether or not they should be able to choose a, a, a treatment which is clearly lacking in evidence. Um, and what would happen once that treatment had been used, found to be ineffective, and they were forced to return to the NHS. What would the, what would the attitude of the NHS be at that point? Thank you. I think I can only put this question to these three gentlemen. Uh, and it is this. If a, a patient came to you for homeopathic treatment and you felt that you might put that patient at risk by treating them in such a way, would homeopaths have the courage to refer them to uh, a traditional clinician because with a homeopath the patient might be at, at risk with the homeopathic treatment against the traditional treatment. I, I find it impossible to generalize across homeopaths. Uh, th they are good homeopaths uh, in, in the sense that they are responsible and, and try their best to look after patients and, and they are uh, homeopaths who are, who, are, who are less well uh, equipped to do that and in, indeed less well trained and I would argue that uh, doctor homeopaths by and large are, are, are better equipped to do, to do that but they, 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 um, 
There are too many different types of homeopaths for me to, uh, to be able to uh, answer do that Do you question. think in general, uh, I know it's difficult to generalize, I accept that point, but do you think homeopaths are adequately qualified to recognize uh, by a clinical diagnosis a serious medical condition? Doctor homeopaths sh should be, because they have studied medicine. Um, anybody who hasn't studied medicine is unlikely to be uh, well equipped for all difficult situations. Dr. Fisher. Well, I can only speak on behalf, really, of the Faculty of Homeopathy, which is a statutory body which only admits members of registered health professions, so that includes doctors, but also veterinarians, uh, dentists, pharmacists, and so on. And for them, the answer to both your questions is absolutely yes, they are equipped um, to make a diagnosis and indeed to recognize that the domain of professional competence. Pharmacists, for instance, it is normal for a pharmacist to give advice over, a, over the counter in the shop and also to say, well, you need to go and see a doctor about that. And so, of course, yes, the answer is they are equipped and they would refer on when required. Thank you. Dr. Unequivocally, yes. Thanks, Jim. Right. Just a quick question to Dr. Matthew. You're, you are an advisor to the British Homeopathic Association. Association. Yes. You don't register homeopaths. No, the, fa the Faculty of Homeopathy does that. Right. We are a charity, right. and I work as research development yeah. advisor for the charity. I just want to ask you about what actions you... And I'm not a homeopathic practitioner. Okay. I just want to ask you if, you if you're able to answer this, and if you're not, I'm sorry, but, but presumably if there is a register, and I know it's an unofficial register, it's not government regulated, that that means that homeopaths who stray outside what they should do ethically and beyond their competence are subject to being struck off, essentially, or disciplined. Yes. I was just wondering why it is that we haven't heard, and maybe I've just not, not heard correctly, that the, I think, 10 out of 11 homeopaths that were willing to prescribe prophylactic homeopathic anti-malarials mm -hmm. in the absence of advice about conventional anti-malarials and bed nets, and avoiding being bitten, which is essential, fundamental, first year medical student advice you give to a traveller go to malaria area, whether any action was taken against them by their regulatory bodies and whether you've heard through your experience or Dr Fisher that this is rife, that, that this practice is either rife or that the, the penalty is that you can't advertise as being a member of the faculty. If I may just, it yes. didn't involve any member of the faculty, all, all members of the faculty. It, is a, it has its own act of parliament, the Faculty of Homeopathy. It only admits registered health professionals, and none of its okay. members were involved in that So the Society case. of Homeopaths, I yes. may be thinking of. Yes. To answer your question yep. more completely, um, the Faculty of Homeopathy is very clear in its um, uh, statement to its pr uh, member practitioners that prophylactic, homeop prophylactic homeopathy is not recommended, and that includes, of course, malaria. We would not support the use of prophylactic homeopathy for malaria. But should the Society of Homeopaths take and register someone who, who prescribes? Pro I mean, they're it's on the market, aren't they, these things? I don't understand why they're on the market, if even you think they shouldn't be used. It doesn't make sense it, to me. It's not for me to uh, suggest the, the behaviour of the Society of Homeopaths, but... That everybody practicing homeopathy should be uh, appropriately registered. Of, of course, they should be, and there's yes. an aim to do just that. Yeah. I just can't. Okay. I'd like to. I, just, I really can't understand this. You say you should not give homeopathic anti-malarials. Yes. <coughs> yet they're on the market. Have you have you urged? Has the faculty urged? Has the BHA, who you yeah. advise scientifically, urged manufacturers to stop manufacturing these things that people might buy? Not quite so explicitly, but we've, we were uh, unequivocally against the, the practice. Well, I'm not sort of aware that, in fact, that homeopathic antimalarials are on the market. The people are using homeopathic medicines and claiming they will prevent malaria. It's, to my knowledge, they're certainly not legally on the market labelled this will, pre this will prevent what malaria. What was your reaction to the Society of Homeopaths Symposium uh, that argued that, uh, that AIDS could be treated homeopathically? I think homeopathy. Uh, I wasn't at it. I don't know what happened, but but certainly in our hospital, we, for instance, treat cancer. Uh, we have a complementary cancer treatment cancer service which uh, uses homeopathy, among other things. And we have recently, indeed, completed a Cochrane review on homeopathy for the management of the adverse effects of cancer. But AIDS, you wouldn't. 
Can you say that you think there's a role for homeopathy in the treatment of AIDS? I have certainly pe treated people who have AIDS, not for the primary condition, but for the complications and problems they have with the, with the disease or with the, uh, the treatment of it. I would never claim to cure AIDS. No, 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 okay, I'm going to finish on, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Ernst, I'm going to finish on, on that note. Well, can I thank you all very, very much indeed for, for joining us uh, this morning. It's been an incredibly useful uh, session. Order, order. Thank you. Now, what we saw was an interesting combination of people with different ideas. And one of them comes from the man from the MHRA. Let's take a look at this again. What he's speaking about is evidence-based, evidence-based medicine. Now let's really take a look at the difference between, quote, evidence-based and what's really happening in the world of medicine is these two camps, this idea of what we call modern medicine versus natural medicine, homeopathy and these things. Let's take a really good look at what's happening. Over here, we see evidence-based medicine, evidence-based. Now that means that we're going to provide evidence, that we're going to not just make things and sell it, we're going to find out do they work, how well it works, test them. This is the idea that happened along, you know, that we're going to put our money where our mouth is, we're going to test things, not just have ideas, because when we have these old ideas, some of these ideas were wrong. Some of these wives' tales didn't really work. But what we have here is evidence-based. As a problem came in with that. Who's going to pay for that evidence? Now, when we do this evidence, we're going to have to involve statistics. And the statistical analysis will help to tell us whether this thing works or not. The statistics are not cheap. The statisticians don't work for free. Even when Poincaré developed some of this way back, he was being funded by Napoleon, who wanted to break the banks at Monaco. Now, this idea of statistical analysis of what is or isn't working has a charge, a fee, thereby entered into money. In order to find that charge, we would look for investors. If we look for investors, the investors are interested in profit. I want to invest in a drug. You're going to do research. I want to invest and give you money to help do your research, provided that I get back my money plus my investment, I want to get a profit when you start selling the drug in the field. Now, this profit motive then came in as a primary motive. Look at here evidence, but before anybody's going to be involved on this side, evidence-based, profit became very distinctly a motive. We would have to make profit. In order to make profit, we would want to be able to control the sales that what we're finding the evidence in, somebody else is not going to steal from us, so thereby we want patent medicine. Patent medicine to guarantee the profit, and that guaranteed profit, patent medicine, meant it couldn't be natural. It had to be synthetic. Synthetic had to be made by man because we cannot patent natural. We can patent synthetic, and synthetic profit, etc., came in on this side of the coin. On the other side, we have the natural, homeopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture, many of these other types of, quote, natural modalities. And with these natural modalities, what was their basic prime directive? What was their number one? Safety. Safety first. First, do not hurt. Hippocrates tells us, first do not hurt. The basic dictum of medicine as we know it. You're going to help people, that's great, but first, don't hurt them. And that's what came along with this idea of natural medicine, homeopathy, that we would not hurt, and that in homeopathy we were looking for the minimal dose, minimal dose. Now over here on the other side, with our evidence-based, the evidence-based side had something else. Not only did it have to have profit, did it have to have synthetic, you know, to control the profits, etc. To do this evidence, based with the statistics of today, we would have to guarantee action. 
When we talk about in statistics, we're talking about that 95% area where we make a null hypothesis, do the test, etc. We want to show that between the treatment group and the placebo group, that there is a difference and that it is 95%. One person out of 20, we lose. We have to show results. That means we have to demand action. When we're using a chemical, whatever it is, we have to make sure that we get an action. We can't use a small amount. Over here with homeopathy, we're going to use the minimal dose. We have to have a statistical proven dose of that synthetic compound. And what happens over in this side? Side effects, massive side effects, incredible side effects, incredible side effects. Let's look at a cut from Boston Eagle. In suggesting liability, how is it foreseeable to us that he would gobble multiple medications, buying them off the internet without even consulting a doctor in person? It's not just foreseeable, it's exactly what you count on, seducing the more vulnerable members of society to fall for your snake oil potions. Oh, that's just absurd. Your Honor, hundreds of thousands of people die every year from prescription drugs. 27,000 people were killed by Vioxx. If you believe one FDA official, possibly 50,000. Yes. But you can't sue these people for Vioxx. This isn't about Vioxx, which they don't even manufacture. I'm talking about an industry-wide pattern. We don't even know all the potential dangers of these drugs because the pharmaceutical industry systematically conceals them. They've been caught buying clinical trials, bribing doctors, distorting science. Many of these so-called peer review articles we see in medical journals are actually ghostwritten by the drug companies themselves. And doctors take payoffs and let their names appear as the authors. You have no evidence that any of that has happened. Because here. you hide it. Your company previously buried evidence which showed a link between antidepressants and suicidal thoughts in children. You did that. Which we still deny. And this isn't that case. He doesn't have one single fact to the support. The fact is the U.S. pharmaceutical industry spends almost twice as much on promotion as it does on research and development. That's obscene. American television viewers see as much as 16 hours of prescription drug advertising each year. 16 hours. That's more time than most people spend at the movies. The fact is, they invent diseases like social phobia, generalized anxiety disorder to sell mind-altering drugs. Anxiety but, is a clinical illness to suggest otherwise. is not only irresponsible. What's irresponsible honor. is we have scores of people being diagnosed with these vague mental disorders, millions of whom are children. What's irresponsible is we have three-year-olds on antidepressants. Why? Because the drug companies, just like Big Tobacco, know that if you get these kids when they're young enough, you have a customer for life. I should sue you right now. You do not get a pass. You want to sue me? Because... Please do. Because truth is a complete defense, and I'm not the only one saying this. This industry invents chronic diseases, be it restless leg, dry eye syndrome, or these unspecified sleep disorders that require taking nightly doses of habit-forming tranquilizers. They first concoct the disorder, next the drug, and then they blitz the public with commercials to convince them they're afflicted, and it's especially effective with senior citizens. My client was popping pills like candy. He almost died. He's out of control. Your industry is out of control. You manufacture and sell disease at exorbitant cause, and the FDA refuses to regulate you. The pharmaceutical lobby has a death grip on Congress. Mr. Shore, you need to settle down. Your Honor, the FDA refuses to go after these people, so let it be me. They very nearly killed a man I dearly love. Let it be me. But let me get started, because they stall. Of the 27 to 50,000 Vioxx deaths, only 18 cases have reached juries so far. 18! Most of the plaintiffs will, in fact, be dead before they're compensated in any way. Well, my client is 75, so please, let me get started on discovery, since clearly I'll need every second. All right. All right. I will let this case stand. What? Are you crazy? Perhaps you have a pill she could take. You're allowing him to go forward with no proximate cause. That's preposterous. What would be preposterous, sir, is if I were to extend the benefit of the doubt to your industry. Do I look like an idiot? They've got a pill for that, too. Will you shut up? I have made my ruling. We are adjourned. You've bitten off more than you can chew this time, my friend. Oh, I don't swallow. I just chew up and spit out. We'll see. Zing. I can see you're good at this. What we just saw from Boston Legal really is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. You see, in certain writings, in fact, Mr. Gary Null in his writing, he tells us the number one killer of people 
Let's look at a little quote from another doctor, another medical doctor, Dr. Loren. What we just saw is evidence that this idea of the evidence-based medicine and its lack of safety concerns has now become the largest killer of human beings on the planet. If we want to know about profit, we have to look at this and we have to look at one other thing called tobacco. Tobacco killing millions of people. Absolute proof that there are people who do not care about health, do not care about people, they care about profit. The big problem here, and let's get back to our statistical analysis. In demanding that action to get that statistical analysis of that 95%, we have to use risky, and every medicine causes side effects. Every medicine causes side effects. All of these evidence synthetic do. When I first came to medical school, my professor, Dr. Barnes, told us to use a synthetic anything is an insult to the human body. It's an insult to the human body. And now we're going to spend the rest of the semester learning how to insult the human body, which is the heart of the medical education. So this is what happened on this side. Over on the other side, we have a little different story. You see over here on this side, the demand for that statistical result doesn't really fit. Because when we have this safety first, natural medicine, what we're going to find out is that we need to remove ourselves from the reductionistic view. Because over here on this side, they have to reduce you to the pre and post test to do the statistics on the evidence-based system, they have to measure you, say they measure your blood pressure before the intervention is the drug and post-measurement. That's the heart of this analysis, pre and post-test, reducing you to the symptom while not measuring the side effects. This is very, very important. We do not measure side effects. We observe side effects. When they do their studies, whatever it is, they don't measure blood sugar if they're, if they're doing blood pressure. They don't measure the blood sugar. They try to observe this. Now what happened back in the 50s and 60s is they made blood pressure medi medications, blood pressure medications that satisfied the pre and post test, evidence-based, and lo and behold, everybody who used them got low-grade diabetes or advanced diabetes. Why? because the side effect of that medication is it upset the blood sugar. Is this a single story? No. Turns out it's the story of every one of the synthetic drugs. They all have some side effect that is discovered later. As that 50 to 100 medications are taken off the market every year because they're killing In doing the statistical analysis, they do not measure the side effects. They observe them. And when they observe them, sometimes they don't get them. It would be very, very, very expensive for us to measure everything when we're doing a test in the pre and post. It would be almost impossible. There's not enough people in the world to do that test where we would measure all possible side effects. There's not enough rats. There's not enough fruit flies to do that test. So this test had to be reductionistic, pre and post, demanding action. Over here on this side, we found out that reductionism doesn't really work. We now know from modern science, reductionism has failed in fractal complex environments. The human body is a complex fractal system. So it's kind of like if you're walking down the road, say you're blindfolded, and you're walking down the road, somebody's behind you, and you start to go to one side, 
there's a ditch over here. The person who's guiding you behind you says, turn left. You walk down the road. You start to go too much to this side. And the person behind you says, turn right. Now, if we made a statistical evaluation of it, the modality, the intervention of turning left or turning right, what would happen? We would find out it doesn't fit. If we thought, if we thought that helping the person was all about turning what, to, the, to the left or turning to the right, we wouldn't be able to make that experiment. Some people are sick because they don't get enough water. Some people are sick because they get too much water. Everything is going to be needed to be evaluated in a holism state. This is what this side found, is that holistic being. That we can't reduce people to those simple things. Because over here on this side, number one is we want to be safe. Safe. Not reductionistic. Safety first. This side has never made anywhere near the profit of this side, because the profit's the prime directive on this side. Profit over here, safety, as we move on. Over here on the profit side, was that story of that blood pressure medication the only one? No. It was the, one of the first synthetic forms of estrogen, ethyl silvesterol. Prescribed as a wonder drug in the 50s and 60s, until they found out that every woman who took it, their children, female children, developed neoplastic growth in the cervix. Well, wait a minute here. Pre and post side effects. Oh, do we have to measure pre and post side effects into further generations? Well, yeah, you do, if you want safety. But this side is not concerned with safety. This side is concerned with in fact, you don't even have to make the drug to get profit. Let's take a look at the boiler maker. No, that's not how it works. Look, if I was asking you to own five or ten thousand shares of some pink sheet bullshit company with negative earnings, I'd tell you to hang up the phone, call your local broker, and short the stock. I wouldn't expect your business. But Don, Don, I am bringing you a 60-year-old billion dollar Come over here. It's not your table. Major FDA landmark approval. It's like the cancer pill, Don. No, it's a cancer pill. No, Don, it's not Propecia P. It is a cancer pill. Oh, Donald, please get the Hey, get the fuck off. Busy, no, look, no, I understand, doctor. I'm, you know, I'm really busy here myself. Look, we're going to come back to you in one month with one idea and one idea only. You know, if you like what we have to say, great. You know, we'll, we'll do business. If not... I mean, worst case scenario, you're going to hear yourself a new business idea. You, Whoever took that x-ray, it is useless. Parties. We're, we're going to part as friends. That's fair, right? Of uh, what? Th doc, are you working with a million dollars in the market right now? Who is this again? Hey, you know, tell me something. You're a doctor. Have you ever heard of a drug called Benadryl? It's being manufactured by MSC Pharmaceuticals. No. Well, listen, listen, okay? Listen, it's in the third stage of FDA approval, all right? Word is it's going to be approved within the next three months. And it could be tomorrow for all I know. But, you know, I, I, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, and you're real busy over there. So why don't I just send you out the information you requested about the firm? No, wait, 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 wait. Forget the info. Forget the info. Let's talk about this now. What was the name of that drug again? <laughs> could you hold on for one second? Uh, I'm going to get... Uh, uh, a senior broker who's a little more familiar with that particular stock, all right? Hold on a second, okay? One second. Rocco! So his name's Dr. Jacobs, and I, I'd say from the sound of it, he's definitely... Well, I don't want to hear it, kid. Okay. Hi, Dr. Jacobs. This is Chris Marlin over at J.T. Marlin. Marlin? Right, he's my father. He's my mother. So my associate tells me you're interested in one of our stocks. I will call her back. Uh, yes, uh, MSC sounds like it might be interesting. 
Might be. Might be doesn't sell stock at the rate MSC is going for it, Dr. Jacobs. We're talking very high volume here. Oh, well, I still have to run it by my people. That's great, Doc, if you want to miss yet another opportunity here and watch your colleagues get rich doing clinical trials and don't buy a share and hang up the phone. Well, hold on a second now. I didn't say that. I just want to talk about it. Tomorrow. Honestly, Doc, I don't have the time. This stock is blowing up right now. The whole firm's going nuts. Hold on. Let me open up the door to my office. <laughs> See that, Doc? That's my trading floor. Now I have a million calls to make to a million other doctors who are already in the know. I can't walk you through this right now. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, let's do this. <laughs> now, since you're a new account, I cannot go any higher than 2,000 shares. I'm sorry. 2,000? Are you nuts? That is way beyond what I was thinking. 2,000? Jesus! Listen, I'm curious, why can't you sell me any more than that? Well, we like to establish a relationship with our clients on something small before we get to the more serious trades. Let me show you several percentage points on this small trade, and then we'll talk about doing future business. That sounds good. Uh, give me the 2,000 shares. Done. You sure you can't do any better on this one? I'm sorry, Dr. Jacobs, I can, I'm sorry. Oh, all right, we'll start with this trade then. Great, I promise we'll swing for the fences on the next one. Confirmation sent to your office or your mansion. Ah, uh -huh, very funny, Mr. Marlin. Let me put my secretary on and she'll take down your info. It was a pleasure doing business with you. Done and done. That's a scene from a movie where you can see here's a person making money selling stock in a company that might get FDA clearance. And how that person tells that story helps to sell that stock to make income for him, income for the movie, inc income for the, the companies, etc. Incredible. As that profit really is a very motivating factor. And there's a story about the man who has the headaches. Headaches start back here and they come forward and they go back and they go forward and they're killing him. And he goes to the doctor. Now the medical doctor says, these type of headaches, if you have pain, we use a pain killer. That's what this side over here has said, see, because they can do pre-test pain, post-test pain. And the amount of, of that pharmaceutical, of course synthetic, because that's to make sure we get our profit back. How much of that to guarantee blockage of this type of pain? Man takes it, but it doesn't work. None of these things work perfectly all the time. He comes back, still has the pain. Doctor tries a different painkiller. The idea of the painkiller is like driving home tonight in your car and the oil light comes on in the dash. You take out a piece of tape, cover up the oil light so it doesn't shine in your eyes. Then you drive home. The oil light comes on for a reason. The pain comes for a reason. Covering it up is a little stupid. That's what this side's all about. Covering up symptoms, because that's the other side of the thing, is this side is over here dealing with symptoms. Over here we're dealing with whole people. This side is symptom-driven because we pre- and post-test measure the symptoms. So this is called symptomatic. We call that allopathy. The man comes back, even the second drug doesn't work. Because that's the doctor's education, to try a pharmaceutical. That's the primary thing that every doctor is taught, how to use this system's development of profit compounds and how to use one of those drugs. And if that don't work, he changes the dosage. And if that don't work, a different drug. And if that don't work, then he goes to surgery. So he told the man was to do surgery. The man had the headaches. Had to sign a waiver, of course, it says right there that medicine is a pseudoscience. We don't really know what's going on. And since we don't really know what's going on, we're going to use this and bingo, boingo. He signs the waiver, wakes up the next morning, and the doctor castrated him. Doc. The doctor says, well, we know that these headaches are related. Okay. 
Doctor says, go get a new house, a new car, a new wardrobe. He buys a new house, he feels better. Buys a new car, he feels better. He goes to buy a new wardrobe, goes into a swing a clothing shop. And the salesman says, pip, pip, cheerio. But I can just look at you and tell exactly what sizes, what styles, what colors you need. Exactly. Just, you don't have to say a word. I can just look at you. The man says, okay. He comes out, group of shirts, 16 sleeves, 18 neck, bingo, boingo. Fit perfect, perfect style. Man doesn't say a word. Comes out with a set of slacks, 32 waist, 33 inseam. Perfect, perfect fit. He looks, get a couple of suits, brings them over, and the suits fit, fit perfectly, right off the rack. Perfect. He looks, I'm taking my size nine sock, size nine shoe, double E, 32 underwear. Here's everything. He lays everything out. A whole wardrobe. And the man goes, it's amazing. You only made one mistake. The salesman said, no, I never make any mistakes. The man says, well, you made at least one mistake. He said, I take a size 32 underwear. The man says, no, I have always worn a size 30 underwear. He said, I take a size 32. And the salesman says, no, I've looked at you, and if you wear a size 30, you're going to get these headaches. You're going to start back here. You're going to go forward. You're going to start back here. Get the message? This side is symptomatically driven to sell a drug or to do surgery for profit. This side is looking at the holistic person with safety first and trying to evaluate what might be done. So this side does not really attend to, quote, when you say evidence, you mean forced, proven, excessive evidence. 20, 19 people out of 20 will take a compound and get that result. The thing is, over here they're saying, listen, safety first. Safety first. There was a story of a man named Joe. Joe was a very bad boy when he grew up. He was always in and out of prison. Just got out of juvie and was back into prison again for stealing. While he was in prison, he had worked and made his body big and huge. And he lived in upstate New York. He was released from prison. He came back, a man in his middle 20s, big, ugly man. Everybody was afraid of. He came into the city and all of a sudden, within the first couple of days, there were some tools missing. Televisions, a boat, everything missing. People kind of knew it was probably Joe. And it won't be long, he'll be back in prison. But in the meantime, they were all afraid. And Joe walked into the city one day. He was walking into the city and he came on these young girls. And the girls hid into the store. They ran into the store to hide. But one girl was kind of a large girl, beautiful but gangly, gangly, large. Her name was Mary. Joe walked up to Mary. There's a dance on Saturday night. Would you go with me? Mary was afraid, but still held her ground and said, would you be a gentleman? Joe was taken back. Thought, he said yes. He went to that dance and was a gentleman. They dated again and he was a gentleman. As the relationship grew, all of a sudden the televisions were returned, the boat was returned, or at least stolen thing. Joe took a job helping people, mending fences, had children with Mary as they got married, and even Joe became the head of the Board of Education. Here was a man that five little words changed his life. Would you be a gentleman? At the right time, the right place, these words came to him to affect his decision process. And that's what help is, off of, is about to this side. Trying to find those five words. The little bit of motivation, how do we find the little bit of motivation to give to you? Those five words. And when we find those five words, how can we tell you maybe to have a little more water? How can we tell you, you know, have less trans fatty acids in your diet and clean up your diet and do some exercise? But if we tried to reduce, if we took 100 inmates out of the local prison and 
had a hundred gangly ladies say to them, would you be a gentleman? We would find out real quick that it's not statistical. In fact, life is not statistical because in this pre and post, that 19 out of 20, that's not the way life is. You might go to a wonderful place for your wedding ceremony and your honeymoon and 10 years later or whatever, you decide you want to go back to that same place, stay in the same room, have the same meal, and it's different. See? The wise man knows every time you step into the stream, it's a different stream. This side knows this. This side is not obsessed with repeatability. This side is obsessed with safety and health. Health, wellness, long-term health. Trying to get people better, healthier, longer. This side is concerned with profit and trying to save people from dying. As in most of the people that was this medicine was designed for was in emergency medicine. There's three different types of ways you can make a medical a medical philosophy for your country. You could choose to do primary intervention before the disease. You could turn you choose to do education and you try to prevent disease. Best example of a medical system like this was back in old China, where they had acupuncturists, and acupuncturists were working with diet and many other different things, blood pressure and pulses and all types of things. And you would only pay the person, the acupuncturist, when you were healthy. You would go visit him. He would tune your body, tune the energies of your body. So when you were sick, you would not pay him. It was his job to keep you healthy. So you wouldn't pay him when you were sick. So it didn't have the profit motive, and its motive was prevention. Second one is a type of health care where there's early intervention. You just start to get sick. One of the best examples of that is modern-day Germany, where Germany says, you need lots of vacation time every year to relax. You need to celebrate the meal to relax. And at the first signs of a problem, one of your coworkers says, hey, hey, Bob, you're getting a little stressed here. You could go off to Baden-Baden and take the cure and take the waters. And the government will pay. That's kind of an idea of a secondary system, early intervention, rather than waiting for it to get extreme. But most people in Germany now, since the advent of evidence-based medicine, kind of wait until they're really, really, really sick. The system is overburdened. Not, there's not enough health spas for the people. So the, the system kind of takes over more. And then America made the choice that they're going to do number three, crisis, crisis care. We're going to wait until your arm's about to fall off and try to save it. We're going to wait until your spleen is about to explode or after your spleen has exploded, <laughs> that we're going to do crisis intervention. And that is what has been tailored into this type of medicine. As if this type of medicine does not have an operant definition of health, it is symptomatic and is created about reducing symptoms. This side over here is about increasing health. One of the nice things about this uh, system over here is that this synthetic drug and this demanding action builds dependency. These people over here get dependent on drugs because when they start taking the drug, the side effect, uh, they start taking the blood pressure drug because they're under too much stress, the side effects come on and they get kidney problems and liver problems. They got to take a different drug. And when they start taking these drugs, they get dependent. You understand that the blood pressure medication is not a cure. It doesn't cure your blood pressure. It's meaning that this is all made on external. We're going to take something external of the body, thereby you're going to get dependent on it, and it makes more profit. Over here on this side, we're really interested in helping people to learn. Over here, we're going to find out doctors are trying to teach. A little cut from diet doctor. Well, the first place we've got to visit is the major source of all your problems, your fridge. 
At first glance, Katrina's fridge looks pretty good. She's a vegetarian and there are plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables. But this fridge contains hidden health risks. Only the green foods like courgettes and tofu are the safe sources of nutrients for Katrina. Amber foods like mushrooms and apples may be aggravating her yeast problem. And all the sweet and fatty red foods like ice cream are dangerous for Katrina. You're a big pudding girl, aren't you? I am. What's going on here? Ice cream. Is this a, is this a favourite, perhaps? Have an extensive collection, don't you? Do you get sugar cravings at all? Intense sugar Do cravings. You? The sugary danger foods for Katrina are everywhere. And amongst the obvious culprits, like ice cream, nestle the hidden sugars in the form of fruit yogurts, pre-packaged pizzas and fruit. And eating dairy products to get vegetarian proteins could be doing her more harm than good. There's a very high percentage of dairy produce and obviously as a vegetarian that's an important source of protein for you. But in your particular case with the hormonal imbalances that, that you've got, these have been found to aggravate some of the problems that you're suffering Definitely. from. But obviously we, we've got to look at different sources in a much bigger variety and that's, that's one of my roles mm. here. You see, these doctors are trying to teach. The word doctor comes from the Latin word eductor, teacher. Thomas Edison once said, the doctors of the future will really be teachers. They will teach you how to live how to eat, how to adapt to your body. That will be what medicine of the future will be, not symptomatic profits of the drug companies. With this idea of the statistics, there's a strong mathematical logic that appeals here. And what we will find is that math people Good, skilled math people will usually choose this type of medicine to follow. Over here, what I have found, because I was one of these good math people, having graduated from high school, top of the class and everything, became an electrical engineer. When I got into medicine, I found I really liked this. But all of a sudden, I found out there was another side, a side with a little bit more intuitive action. And that over here on this side, these people are math-phobic. They don't understand math. When I write articles, they, have, they say there's too many numbers. These people are math-philic. They love math. And feel this attraction. They, love, they like math. And the phobia people, they hate math. These people don't really understand each other. The more verbal mind. linear mind versus the intuitive mind, the non-linear mind. Now we need to kind of get these things together. We need to really say, what are we going to do now in the future? Because this system here has failed. In fact, just to give it a little sugar-coated message and what about this, to give you a real nice little sugar-coated message uh, with tact and skill just to tell these people, just what happened. I want to really just you know, reach out and very compassionately give you a sugar-coated message that you fucked up bad, real bad, how bad, so bad, so incredibly motherfucking bad, you're killing millions of people with this shit! Your evidence-based crap, your verbal obsessiveness, your compulsiveness, your small little tiny minds worried about every little bit of tiny little bits of paper are hurting people, killing people, masses you fail miserably I hope that that wasn't too much for you my little sugar coated message I'd hate for me to tell you what I really think we're going to have to look at both sides here because over here what we're going to find is that the education is really poor the lack of good scientific minds the lack of the educational process is bad over here. And these people react on stories. These people react on statistics, math. These people react on stories about maybe what a person wears, dresses. These people believe in so many stories. 
they can be easily, easily duped. Like muscle testing. No scientific evidence that really supports that holding a vitamin will change your muscle. In fact, if you were to hold a simple weight, a constant weight, things don't change. They have to apply pressure. And, and when they apply pressure and we measure it, they apply variant pressure. They press harder when they want you to be weak and they press less when they want you to be strong. They change the pressure, it's muscle testing. It's a complete fraud. Just have a little sugar-coated message to these people. We deal with the muscle testing and the point probes and the little things and the divinations and all that. Just want to give you a sugar-coated message with lots of tact and compassion and skill to tell you a sugar-coated message. You're fucked up bad. How bad? So incredibly bad. You have to understand that it's the therapist that controls everything in this kind of crap. You and me will have been duped. You need to have some type of analysis. You gotta learn that the, you have to investigate. You have to do some evidence. You cannot live in this airy, fairy, wacko world and sell your crap and make little devices that make homeopathic electrically and it doesn't work. It barely works. You need to get your head out of your ass and find out what really is going on and listen to some science. Skio is the word for science, to know. We duke doors, doctor. But we need to work together. We need some scientists. We need these skills. We need these skills. And the first thing we're going to need is safety. We're going to need evidence, but we do not need one out of 20. We do not need to demand action. We need to look at more statistical analysis of nonlinear systems. Nonlinear systems. To find out that water and good diet and exercise and a combination of things like we show you in the courses that we do here at Immune, International Medical University. We can show you how a lifestyle coupled with good homeopathy, electrical medicine, these things are evidence-based. We need to blend a new type of system. We need to find out ways, because one of the things we're gonna have to do we're going to have to stop the sales of cigarettes. No. Okay, everybody out there who smokes, all of a sudden, reach for the knob and hang on. Hang on. I know that you're heavily addicted to one of the most addictive substances in the world. I understand that. You're a junkie needing a fix. And you don't like it when somebody tells you this. But it's the truth. And of course you don't like the truth. You have to do something. An adult should have the chance of choice that is true. But now in the system today, you can choose an addictive killer substance such as tobacco, but you can't choose biofeedback. It's a ludicrousity. You can't choose some of this because there's little people who don't want you to do this. We need to broaden our ability to choose. We need to make sure that the adults who do smoke can continue to smoke. But we need to impose the death penalty if you let your child below the age of 18 put a cigarette in his mouth. We need to impose a heavy, heavy duty fine. You should not be able to induce a, an addictive substance. You should be responsible for that addictive substance dramatically so that your children do not smoke and we do not have children smoking. We must stop this. It should never happen that a child age 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever, should become addictive before the age of choice based on the fact that their mother is too stupid to put the cigarettes away in a secure place. We need to impose some real social stopping because by the time you're 21 and you can make a good choice, most of these people don't want to choose that shit. But of course, the chemical companies and the drug companies and the tobacco companies don't want that. They don't want choice. They dominate through this profit. They have the money and the profit. They hire the small-minded people to attack these people. to get together and leave this.
So in final summary, I wanted to review the ideas of this evidence-based, what we saw here in the homeopathy side. I wanted to see just what's going on here. That yes, there's problems in the homeopathy industry. There are problems in the drug industry. Yes, there are concerns. And that by looking at this thesis and antithesis, perhaps we can come to a better ideal and development and a true health care, not a disease care, not an airy-fairy, whatever we want, but something with a true modern medicine to develop forward. I put this little tape together for you. There's some support issues in the book, and I hope that this has become more clear as to what really needs to happen in medicine today. I thank you. Desiree Dubonet.